Okay, we are live in 2023. It's 10 o'clock in the east. Do you know where your children are? <laughs> we are beginning a momentous year of a reading of the Red Book by C.G. Jung. Um, and um, I want to uh, read a part of the introduction to introduce uh, the Red Book a little bit. So the Red Book is Dr. Jung's uh, experience with himself, his experiment on himself. And it is not to be taken literally. In other words, um, his psyche was telling him things, and he recorded them for about five years in what today is known as the Red Book or the Black Book. So then he transposed it into the Red Book over a period of 16 years. And there are, apparently there are 13 major um, imaginations, uh, active imaginations in the Red Book. And but what he was doing was trying to understand how his own psyche worked. And in the process, he discovered the collective unconscious. And this came at a very emotional time in Western Europe. Uh, the, the countries of Western Europe were hooking up to World War I. And um, so I'm so what we have to understand is that the psyche does not speak to us in English or any other language that we know of. It speaks to us in images. Now, what do I mean by that? I mean that as various species developed over millions of years, they would, if they got an image in their head, let's say of a tiger, which would be a predator, then they would guess that there might be a predator in the vicinity. And it wasn't talking to, to these creatures or to all creatures, right? It was just a warning, a prefiguration that something was happening. Uh, Happy New Year, Art. Nice to see you today and Happy New Year to you, Justin. And so what Dr. Jung is presenting is what appeared to him from his psyche. And you aren't crazy if you have such visions because we all have these visions and this is how our psyche has always communicated with us since long before there was language. And it's only in the last uh, ten, few tens of thousands of years that we've developed what we call language and what we call writing skills and so on. But up until then, it was all based on image in all of our pre predecessors. So, um, what I'm going to read is just a portion of the introduction to the Red Book first to set the scene. And then over this coming year, uh, Jordan and I and anyone else that joins us on the Zoom panel will um, do a commentary, a reading and commentary of the entire Red Book from soup to nuts. Today is day one. And uh, so happy new year, everyone. Uh, we survived the Christmas season. And for me, literally, that means survival because the Grim Reaper came uh, three times to my family uh, over the holiday. And uh, we walked away from every event that occurred, uh, including me. Uh, I nearly broke my neck, literally broke my neck. Um, on uh, the Friday before Christmas. Um, but my wife has just come out of the hospital on Friday after having a very dangerous bout with flu, you know, flu type A. 
So if ever you uh, have an experience of flu, uh, don't hesitate to go into the hospital because my wife walked to the ambulance, but three days later she had a crisis. Uh, and if she had had that crisis at home, she would have died. I'm convinced of that. And so uh, just be aware. I think that's why we kill so many people with flu every year, because we just don't get uh, support, life support from the hospital when we need it. Um, but in any case, um, going back to the introduction, it, there's a very nice introduction. Uh, by Sona Shandasani, which in which he basically describes the nuts and bolts of Jungian psychology. And I urge you to read that. It's a very uh, easy read, relatively, and um, and I'm not going to read it all today, but I do want to uh, set the stage. So what I'm going to do is, uh, and I'll Point out, I'm using uh, the Red Book Reader's Edition. Of course, this is not the big folio edition of the Red Book. Um, and I'm just doing that for convenience because it's a book I can handle at the, at the desk rather than the big uh, cumbersome uh, folio edition. And so I'm going to begin on page 27 of the English uh, translation of the Red Book, uh, Reader's Edition, and it's, I'm beginning with a paragraph that begins with the words on July 28th. So this is um, July 28th, 1914, and it's in the period immediately be before the beginning of World War I in earnest. Um, and uh, Yes, and Kathy, it was a dense weekend for me. My sister almost died also. But that's a different story. Okay, so page 27. On July 28, 1914, Jung gave a talk on the importance of the unconscious in psychopathology at a meeting of the British Medical Association in Aberdeen, Scotland, of course. He argued that in cases of neurosis and psychosis, the unconscious attempted to compensate the one-sided conscious attitude. The unbalanced individual defends himself against this, and the opposites become more polarized. The corrective impulses that present themselves in the language of the unconscious should be the beginning of a healing process but the form in which they break through makes them unacceptable to consciousness. And where have we seen this in our current affairs lately? Uh, same thing happening uh, in the election for Speaker of the House of Representatives in the United States. A month earlier, on June 28th, Archduke Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was assassinated by Gabrilo Princip, a 19-year-old Serb student. On August 1, war broke out. In 1925, Jung recalled, quote, I had the feeling that I was in an overcompensated psychosis, and from this feeling I was not released till August 1, 1914. Years later, he said to Mircea Eliade, as a quote, as a psychiatrist, I became worried, wondering if I was not on the way to doing a schizophrenia, as we said in the language of those days. I was just preparing a lecture on schizophrenia to be delivered at a Congress in Aberdeen. And I kept saying to myself, quote, I'll be speaking of myself. Very likely, I'll go mad after reading this paper, end quote. The Congress was to take place in July 1914, exactly the same period when I saw myself 
in my three dreams voyaging on the southern seas on january on july 31st immediately after my lecture i learned from the newspapers that war had broken out finally i understood and when i disembarked in holland on the next day nobody was happier than i now i was sure that no schizophrenia was threatening me i understood that my dreams and my visions came to me from the subsoil of the collective unconscious what remained for me to do now was to deepen and validate this discovery and this is what i've been trying to do for 40 years unquote at this moment jung considered that his fantasy had depicted not what would happen to him but to europe in other words that it was a precognition of a collective event what he would later call a big dream after this realization he attempted to see whether to and to what extent this was true of the other fantasies that he experienced and to understand the meaning of this correspondence between private fantasies and public events this effort makes up much of the subject matter of Liber Novus. In Scrutinies, he wrote that the outbreak of the war had enabled him to understand much of what he had previously experienced and had given him the courage to write uh, the earlier part of Liber Novus, that's the Red Book. Um, thus, he, um, and just as an, an, an aside, um, Sham Dasani and others refer to the Red Book as Liber Novus. Uh, I have a criticism of that because I don't think that's what the intended name was, um, it, which literally means new book. Uh, and I believe that it was already embossed on, on his Red Book when he received it. Uh, but and so I always refer to the Red Book as the Red Book, but um, you know, professional unions call it Liber Novus, and they have their reasons, and I have mine. Thus, he took the outbreak of the war as showing him that his fear of going mad was misplaced. It is no exaggeration to say that had war not been declared. Liber Novus would in all likelihood not have been compiled. In 1955-56, while discussing active imagination, Jung com commented that the reason why the involve involvement looks very much like a psychosis is that the patient is integrating the same fantasy material to which the insane person falls victim because he cannot integrate it, but is swallowed up by it. It is important to note that there are around 12 separate fantasies uh, that Jung may have regarded as precognitive. Okay, in other words, fantasies that were warning him of something that was happening in the future. Okay, so I'm going to go through these 12 fantasies. And I, uh, I agree with, I'm still getting into finding it, but it's, I agree with your Lieber Novus being, just call it the Red Book, because I think that was, you're right, the proprietary embossing that just came on the leather cover. Yeah. And and I, I actually have proof of it in a, fo in a photograph of the Red Book. Uh, but um, but I don't want to get into that argument now because yeah. uh, Dr. Sham Dasani doesn't agree with me. <laughs> well, <laughs> or, and I think or he might agree with me, but we've never discussed it. Go ahead. Well, I think I think his, his historical integrity as an historian is that that is on the cover. So just like something on a cover stone uh, over a tomb or something, that it's on it. So he's going to include it instead of editing off because you know X, Y, or Z book fabrication company did that so i think he's it's kind of like taking a picture he won't use any white out i mean historically yeah. so yeah i mean it's a, it's like buying a uh diary or something and on the back of the diary it says diary or it says memories or something like that and that's right. already put there by the printer 
and I don't believe it was put there by Dr. Young. Or if there's a barcode and then someone says, oh, look at the skinny family fa- family portrait. <laughs> right. Like, no, that's a, <laughs> that's a barcode. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, all right. So now I'm going to go through these 12 precognitive events. First and second October, 1913. Repeated vision of flood and death of thousands and the voice that said that this will become real. Three October, three, uh, number three, autumn, 1913. Vision of the sea of blood covering the northern lands. Four to five December, um, four to five are December 12th and 15th, 1913 image of a dead hero and the slaying of Siegfried in a dream. 6 December, uh, 6, number 6, I'm sorry, number 6, December 25th, 1913, so Christmas Day, 110 years ago. Image of a foot of a giant stepping on a city and images of murder and bloody cruelty. July 2nd, 1914, image of a sea of blood and a pre and a procession of dead multitudes january 22nd 1914 his soul comes up from the depths and asks him if he will accept war and destruction she shows him images of destruction military weapons human remains sunken ships destroyed states etc may 21st 1914 a voice says that the sacrifice fall left and right. Uh, and then uh, 10 to 12, June, 1914, 10 to 12 are June through July, 1914. Thrice reported dream of being in a foreign land and having to return quickly by ship and this descent of the icy cold. Okay, now I'll leave it to everyone to read the introduction in your own copy of the Red Book. But in the frontispiece, uh, which was written, uh, there's a quote of Jung that was written in 1957 when he looked back at the Red Book. And he says, The years of which I have spoken to you when I pursued the inner images were the most important time of my life. Everything else is to be derived from this. It began at that time and the later details hardly matter anymore. My entire life consisted in elaborating what had burst forth from the unconscious and flooded me like an enigmatic stream and threatened to break me. That was the stuff and material for more than one life. Everything later was merely the outer classification, the scientific elaboration, and the integration into life. But the numinous beginning, which contained everything, was then. Okay, so with those preambles now, uh, I want to uh, begin the actual reading of... um, of chapter one, and um, when I think uh, what I think is interesting to note his dream that he you know got him so bent up that oh my is psychosis setting in on me the precog piece of understanding how expansive the psyche can be I mean some people see further and when he's having the precog the precognition I think that set the tone for later in his career. One of his clients, he thought she might be really, and he said, she might, I thought she was really crazy until I realized she was a highly, highly intuitive introvert. And so I think it gave him the ability to stop judging his clients, um, so like Freud would, in a sense, and actually look at what is in front of him, who is in front of him. And because I think you're right that I don't think the Red Book would have occurred if 
he hadn't had that confirmation that, oh, this was simply intense and it was about the world and me in it, but not directly about him. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there are some chat comments here. Let me address those. Uh, Virgil says, do, do the other Red Book videos actually kind of jump around the book from the Red Book playlist? And um, I would say that I don't remember how I constructed the playlist per se, but that I did read the entire uh, Red Book cover to cover, and I read all the footnotes at that time. And um, so they are all on they are all recorded on this youtube channel if you want to try to find them uh, actually the first 10 chapters are uh, the, the mo among the most popular uh videos on this youtube channel um and uh i think the chapter one is actually number two or three out of 1300 videos so, uh, but they're, they're all there if you uh, look for them. Uh, and I think that they're in order, but I, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, and Mo says they are in order. And as far as I know, at least only went through the first four, four or five. And Virgil says, I noticed there were about 10 videos of about 15 minutes length, each one of the, on the Red Book playlist. So I figured that probably not the whole book. Well, it is the whole book. And Susan says, good morning. Looking forward to the reading of the Red Book. Virgil, is what's happening here a con continuation of that working towards the end? Uh, I guess not, as it's titled Chapter 1. Uh, this is not a continuation of that previous reading. That previous reading was me alone reading the Red Book without for the most part without commentary i simply read the red book and i read the footnotes for each chapter and uh so if you want that style uh you can already find that on this youtube channel this is uh, a labor of love by uh, jordan hoggard and me uh to present the red book uh, again, but this time with commentary. And Jordan, I don't know if you're aware of the fact that you are not on video, so we cannot see. Your... I'm not. I'm still dialing through the Dropbox to find the Red Book Reader's Edition. Okay. I'm, not actually, I'm actually not sure the Reader's Edition is there, but I do know that the, that the Folio Edition is there. That um, I, yeah, that I, that's downloaded. Um, yeah. Okay, so I'll... Okay. Let me just close this and I'll come back. So, uh, so Virgil says, uh, let's see. Mo, I didn't get that, that far, so I wouldn't have noticed. Sounds like you're right, though. That's why way too sure uh, is. Okay, so, you know, I'm expecting this reading and commentary to take about a year on Sunday mornings. So... Right. I'm confused, but also very appreciative as I don't like voice actors, but I do like audiobooks, so this will be perfect. And I struggle to sit still and read an actual book. And I, I feel the same way, not Virgil, but I do. Uh, when I'm reading young, uh, I don't mind reading an actual book because I read it so carefully and um underlining it and so on so i'm not reading it like a novel well, i started with his videos for the same reason but eventually bought my own copy and started reading it that way after reading daily for a couple of months and cutting down on my internet content content my attention span got much better and jaunty says Red Book is no audio distraction. Maybe start with something simple like Meister Eckhart. Well, and, you know, there are um, uh, there are 1,300 plus videos on this YouTube channel. So there's plenty to listen to if you want an audio distraction. Uh, I've never bothered to put, the, put it on... Um, soundcloud or those things because i figure you can just use youtube like a 
of like an audio version if you want to, uh, which I've done many times while driving. I just turn the video on and then turn my cell phone upside down so I'm not looking at the video and I listen to it. All right. So Dr. Young was the son of a Swiss Reformed pastor, a Protestant pastor, and he had seven uncles who were Swiss Reformed pastors. And the uh, work of the Protestant church was their main business uh, for generations. I think, if I recall correctly, about seven generations. And so Jung um, was fully steeped in the Bible and the Protestant um, oeuvre. Now, if you read uh, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, you know that Jung fell out of the church when he was 11 years old because um, two things happened. One was he had a vision of God defecating on the Cathedral of Basel, and the other was that he uh, went to... um, Uh, he went to his first communion and he didn't find anything numinous happening. And so uh, the only time that he darkened the door of a church, uh, there were two times. One was on his wedding and the second time was at his funeral. So the only conscious time that he was in a church after that uh, was on um, his wedding. So I but think that, he, that can be par for the course for a PK, you know, for a preacher's kid, because um, by 11, you've had enough, you know, vacation day, Bible school, Sunday morning, uh, et cetera, et cetera, where you pretty much had multiple PhDs just from swimming in that environment. And so, I, you know, the precociousness, too, of his high IQ and intelligence um, at about 11, I, I that just feels right where he'd go, mm, no, that wasn't numinous. So I need to go find the living God in a sense, right. you know, like you had done with the videos of finding the living God. So I, that that's, I think that's an important part of his history of the, the exile self exile in a way right. to find his own way. Yep. Okay. So um, we're going to switch off on uh, the reading. Um, I'm going to read the first, he put, several biblical quotes before the beginning to sort of set the stage. Um, And uh, so chapter one is entitled The Way of What is to Come. And uh, the first... How do we want to work this with... I only have the folio and not the reader's edition. Uh, Well, it's the same exactly. Um, You just go to the beginning of chapter one. In okay. the folio. Um, yeah. All right. And so, um, so I'm going to read the first quote, and then I'll leave it to you for the next one. So he quotes from the Old Testament. Isaiah said, "Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant." And as a root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when will when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. The quote is from Isaiah 53, 1 through 4. And of course, this is Isaiah's um, prophecy of the coming uh, of of um, the Messiah. Okay. So you go ahead. I'm I'm catching up in the folio. 
Hold on one second. All right, I'll go on then. For unto us a, a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And that's from Isaiah 9, 6. And then, are you with right. me? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm there now. All right. um, the next one, John said, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John 1, 14. Isaiah said, the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them, and the desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart and the tongue of the dumb, of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall waters break out and streams in the desert and the parched ground shall become a pool and the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons where each lay shall we be grass with reeds and rushes and a highway shall be there and a way and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for those, the, way, the wayfaring men, though fools shall not err therein. Isaiah 35, 1 through 8. Okay, so what is happening here is looking back on it, looking back on 35 years of study, um, I can say that Jung was sort of setting the stage in the context of Western European culture. But what he is saying metaphorically is that the way of what is to come is within us. It's within all of us. And while many Protestants today um, won't step aside uh, from the idea of Christ being the only Son of God, what actually is said in the Bible is that we're all sons and daughters of God. And, uh, and that's exactly what it says in John 1, 1 through 14. And, but we have been brought up in a certain way with a certain kind of magical thinking uh, about our lives, and um, and so we're blinded from understanding what the Bible is actually saying, and mm -hmm. and the the basic the most fundamental point here is that um, in the physical world, we human beings are animals, and when we die, our uh, carcass is just dead meat, like any other animal. Uh, but uh, we food are for worms. good for As food for worms, yeah. But we are blessed with the opportunity uh, to leave a, a unique spirit on the earth uh, that... Um, that lives on after us, that is our immortality, if you will. And that immortality comes in the form of our children. It comes in the form of our works. It comes in the form of many things. And so if we understand that, then we can say, oh boy, okay, I better get going in this life and leave some things. So for example, I got going on this YouTube channel because I wanted to say some things uh, to my grandchildren, but my grandchildren were too young to hear them. And so I decided to make videos that would 
they would be able to find years later after my death. And uh, so, you know, the, in essence, this has been uh, a gift to my grandchildren, first and foremost. But then beyond that, we now have over 18,000 followers on this YouTube channel. So you can start to see um, what it all means. I think it's worthy of saying with Isaiah 35, verse 1 through 8 that you just read, this to me is an evident expression of the unconscious. Yeah. If I, if I read this whole thing as a night ocean idea, the wilderness and the sol solitary place shall be glad for them. Well, the wilderness, there, there is not going to be anything other than pure, unadulterated nature in the psyche, in the unconscious. And the solitary place, it's all infinity, a universe, the solitary of everything. And then when it gets down to, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened. Well, people who are blind still have thoughts. They can see, feel, experience their psyche. Mm -hmm. the, the lame man leap as a heart, the tongue, tongue of the dumb sing, because all those things occur in their psyche, but they can't operate the mouth. They can't see with the eyes, but they have the inner vision. And then with, uh, the parched ground shall become a pool. Now we have this uprising of the creative wellspring pulling up and basically pouring out as a font from the unconscious, going from the dark to the light. And then the thirsty land springs of water in the habitation of dragons. Well, that that's then you, the outside garden is starting to be nourished by the unconscious. And that whole quote that you had from the confluence is the whole purpose of Jung's psychology is to um, make available the healing power of the unconscious. And I think this Isaiah 35, one through eight is a, a wonderfully poetic, but actually pretty literal. Um, this is where the waters emanate in the first place. Right. Okay. Now I think it's important for us to read some footnotes. Can you see these footnotes, Jordan, in what you're looking at? Let me. Okay, would you read uh, footnotes one through six, please? You got it. Um, footnote one Medio medieval manuscripts were numbered by folios instead of pages. The front side of the folio is the recto, the right hand page of an open book. And the back is the verso, the left hand of an open book. In Liber Primus, Jung followed this practice. He reverted to contemporary pagination in Liber Secundus in 1920, uh, footnote two. In 1921, Jung cited the first three verses of this passage from Luther's Bible, noting the birth of the Savior, the development of the redeeming symbol takes place where one does not expect it and from precisely where a solution is most improbable. And he's referencing the Collected Works, volume six, Paragraph 439 in Psychological Types, volume six. Um, footnote number three. In 1921, Jung cited this passage, noting the nature of the redeeming symbol is that of a child. That is the childlikeness of the presuppositionlessness of the attitude belongs to the symbol and its function. This childlike attitude necessarily brings with it another guiding principle in place of self-will and rational intentions whose godlikeness is synonymous with superiority. Since it is of an irrational nature, the guiding principle appears in a miraculous form. Isaiah expresses his connection very well, 9-5. These honorific titles reproduce the essential qualities of the redeeming symbol. The criterion of, in quotes, godlike effect is the irresistible power of the unconscious impulses. And that's from psychological types. Right. Now let's comment on this for a minute. The idea of symbol is that the psyche will present us with an image, which is a symbol of what it's trying to say to you. 
Okay, if you if you're caught between a rock and a hard place, your psyche will deliver to you an an unexpected solution that you were you ha- could not possibly have thought back out rationally, but it will present that solution as a symbol. It will present a symbol of what the solution is. So go and ahead. That, yeah, I was going to say, and that um, that expresses the fact that symbols are generative, and to put that as a finer at a finer grain, this childlike attitude necessarily brings with it another guiding principle in place of self-will and rational intentions. So there's that childlikeness where children are relatively unstoppable. Yeah, I mean, you know, and and a lot of people try to tame them rather than help them regulate and navigate and um the taming is often because you know well they're overloaded you know the adults are but i love this um the nature of the redeeming symbol is that of a child and then because it brings with it that other or another guiding principle in place of self-will and so that's a finer grain of symbols are generative child likeness is generative as opposed to childishness, which is suffocating. And, and it, it's our job to integrate what the symbol means, to bring it into consciousness, to try to interpret it ourselves. And this is what Jungian analysts are doing in the clinic, is trying to help their clients understand what these symbols are that are being presented by their own psyche and if you can't understand them then you're drowning in them and and therefore you're um you're having a problem with a neurosis or a psychosis and uh jordan and my favorite quote is the quote about J- uh, james joyce jordan right. want to take that well, yeah, it's, um, James Joyce's daughter was, you know, in a horrible place, emotionally, psychologically, she was depressive. And James Joyce didn't understand because, you know, he's, he's thinking, well, I'm this model, I, you know, I, 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 I swim so easily in these dark places. And Jung said, that's it. She's drowning where you so easily swim. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the, you know, common of the modeling where, yeah, he's he's got the childlikeness, childlikeness, but she doesn't understand the propositionlessness where she's trying to she's still trying to come to reason, and that becomes a little more childish or puerile, as it were. And he didn't understand that he needed to model to her how he learned to swim so well and how basically WSI water safety instructor training yeah. helped his daughter learn to swim. But yeah, yeah. He, she when Jung right. said she's drowning where you so e- in the dark places you so easily swim. Yeah, and so Matt says as uh, we are going through troubling times ourselves, maybe not in the degree of World War II, and it's actually World War One that we're talking about here, but uh, but troubling nonetheless. Dreams and visions of the subsile of the psyche are possible from the collective thoughts and of course i would say absolutely true you know Mm -hmm. we all of our all of us are having dreams and i've i've had a couple of big dreams uh in the course of doing this over the years but um you know when in one one big dream uh i was hoping for a solution and uh part of the dream was that i envisioned the battle of midway and that was my psyche telling me that we were only mid midway in the process and that we had a long way to go it didn't didn't have anything to actually do with the battle of midway but it it was my psyche telling me we're only halfway there you know it'll it's going to take some time um and um and that to me reminds me of peter pan where it's not peter pan that's the symbol the symbol that's conjured by peter pan is captain hook 
And Captain Hook is the foresight of Peter Pan to see what it looks like to individuate. You go out into life, you might lose a hand and get the utility of a hook. Yeah. And then the patch is just another tool from a place where people work in the light and in the dark. Because often, you know, the pirates don't have in their job description that every time a, a rope snaps, they're required to, you know, throw their eye in front of it to lose one. It's yeah. that would be rather absurd. <laughs> right. When they're going okay, down below. They slide it over and the eyes already adjusted. So Peter Pan and then your midway piece, there's a lot of trickster things going on. So understanding how to feel, think them, rather than literally take them as, you know, oh, midway, this island, island near Hawaii, you know, I mean, it's, or the battle is different. You have to kind yeah. of listen. Right. So Simmer down, is, Simmer down Honey says, have you interpreted your dreams? And uh, I absolutely have. You can find lots of videos of me interpreting my own dreams. One thing we don't do is interpret other people's dreams on this channel. Uh, some other uh, followers of Young do uh, do that. I do not. And uh, I'm not a mental health professional. I make no claims in that regard. I'm simply presenting Dr. Young's work as I understand it. That's the best I can do. And, and uh, my, for myself in the early 90s, I, I for three years, I would every morning would spend 30 minutes just literally typing what the dream was. And then, then the evening, I would just go in and start writing about the dream. And I laugh, you know, a dream would be a paragraph or two, maybe two pages, sometimes three. But then there would be 15, 20 pages of this and that and this and that and all the architectural interrelations of what was going on and i remember having a, a pile of printer paper 12 inches tall of these are all the dreams and i love that now unfortunately that was probably the first thing i ever lost in a move <laughs> it's like you know it's like, okay well it's, like, wow. it's probably yeah, telling you something um yeah it's, um, yeah, it's like my to, my father with right. his his uh, sword, his Navy sword, uh, as a naval officer, he hand carried it with me, with him yeah. to every new duty station. And when when he retired, he shipped it and it was stolen. Uh, yeah. And yeah, there so you I, I ended up having to give him a new one, uh, which is now with my grandsons. But anyway, Gander says... One of the most frustrating aspects about the mysteries is that once initiated, regardless of your ability to convey information, it can't be shared with the profane or the unready. And boy, is that ever true. I mean, either you're ready to uh, accept the Red Book or you're not. Um, and if you're not, then you probably ought to go look for something else on YouTube. Uh, but if you are ready, then um, then you, you're going to grok it as we're talking about these things. Mm -hmm. OK, so that, we're up. That, that brings Joyce back to mind, where to me, part of that initiation is getting past the knowledge and getting to the comfortability with the not knowing where when you want to know something about a thing, look between the thing, you know, in terms of the space between the notes. And that will that will give you the resonance of the relationship in that space, rather than looking at the thing and getting limited. If you take right. two things, space between is always a relationship. And so, if people are still trying to prove, 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 or explain, 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 right? There's a not ready quality. Right. Van Clyburn once said, uh, uh, "You know, what's unique about my piano playing is." Uh, not that I can play the notes, but how I would play the spaces between the notes. And, yes. and um, uh, you know, anybody can pick up a, a Chopin piece and, and hack away at it uh, yeah. w with their, uh, you know, full-size keyboard from Best Buy for less than $150. But... Um, but you have to have a you have to have absorbed it so much that you can play the spaces between the notes the yeah. you know the notes representing 
you know, rationality and the space between representing what we're talking about. Okay, so we're, go ahead. Clyburn. My grandmother would always listen to Van Clyburn and she would say, like no other, look, listen, he's yeah. not tapping or touching anything. And on a Steinway, it's water over rocks. So, right. I mean, she saw the space between and the notes as, you know, one flowing piece. And I think it's because Van Clyburn was adjusting that space between the notes or even Viktor Frankl's, you know, there's a space between stimulus and response where you have a choice as how, how you react or respond. And Van Cliver was doing that between every single note. Right punctuation is just as important as words. Absolutely. Same idea. Okay. So we are now up to the beginning of this chapter. We've read the pre preface. We've read uh, the 12 prefigurations. And now we're ready to begin. And so I will read it. It says, uh, written by C.G. Jung with his own hand in his house in Kutznacht, Zurich, in the year 1915. So it was in 1915 that he had acquired this 400-page blank book bound in leather, red, uh, and he had be began to write in it. And here's what he says. If I speak in the spirit of this time, I must say no one and nothing can justify what I must proclaim to you. Justification is superfluous to me since I have no choice, but I must. I have learned that in addition to the spirit of this time, there is still another spirit at work, namely that which rules the depths of everything contemporary. The spirit of this time would like to hear of use and value. I also thought this way, and my humanity still thinks this way. But that other spirit forces me never, nevertheless to speak beyond justification, use, and meaning. Filled with human pride and blinded by the presumptuous spirit of the times, I long sought to hold the, that other spirit away from me, but I did not consider that the spirit of the depth from time immemorial and for all the future possesses a greater power than the spirit of this time, who changes with the generations. The spirit of the depths has subjugated all pride and arrogance to the power of judgment. We look away, uh, he took away my belief in science. He re robbed me of the joy of explaining and ordering things, and he let devotion to the ideals of this time die out in me. He forced me down to the last and simplest things. The spirit of the depths took my understanding and all my knowledge and placed them at the service of the inexplicable and the paradoxical. He robbed me of speech and writing for everything that was in his service, namely the melting together of sense and nonsense, which produces the supreme meaning. Jordan. And then, what's the supreme meaning? What? Is no, 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 don't read on yet. Let's talk about these two paragraphs first. Well, he's, yeah, this is stripping down to what is entirely animal but animal with clarity of observation, clarity of vision, clarity of life, but not all the footnotes and writing and talking and explaining. It's This is getting down to simply living. Because when he, say, um, when he says, uh, robbed me of the joy of explaining and ordering things, and he let devotion to the ideals of this time, i.e. rationalism, die out in me, he forced me down to the last and simplest things, which are the first part of the path also. Yeah. And so, so uh, which of us as men doesn't get pleasure out of mansplaining things? You know, we all mansplain things. And uh, maybe women do it too, or women explain things. They we, we all want to be able to explain things, but there are things that are inexplicable. And so 
what the Red Book does and what we can do here is only point to it. We cannot have you experience what we're talking about unless you know yourself. And normally, perhaps in midlife, during the midlife crisis, uh, people do have a, a numinous experience that says, ah, now I get it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I've had many of those experiences. We just spent three months talking about synchronicity, uh, which if you are sensitive to synchronicity, um, then, then, uh, oh my God, synchronicity is everywhere. Um, and, and so once it happens to you in a, in a, numinous way then you can never forget it but you also can't convince others unless they get unless they grok it they have to have the experience themselves Jordan. right and i find too that instead of mansplaining if instead you flip to ask questions then it 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 um it enlivens the situation instead of oh look at look at me look at me look at me king in the mountain stuff and which ends up being kind of amateur power play or playing yeah. with oh look this but I, I found something yesterday, um, and it was a statement, a short conversation between a dragon and, and, and knights. But it was it was hilarious. But it was also it, it's it talked about this, and that it starts off that um, the knights you can't hoard princesses. The knights shouted, "I don't," said the dragon. Tima, for instance, she's a farmer. That's not what you keep them locked in. The lock is on the inside, the dragon said. What? The dragon continues. They're not locked in. You're locked out. They can't do that. And then the dragon comes back. I see why now. <laughs> you know, so the, you're locked out. I see why now. Because then they're trying to control. And the problem yeah. with control is we don't control anything. We can navigate. But I think that even the mansplaining piece, um, that's Jung losing all that of, oh, I no longer need to show I'm an expert. I'm not applying for a job with myself. Right. I can simply be. Now, Col Coleman Remington says, symbols overwhelming people into psychosis, question mark. Any works by Jung or any other that talk about ways to counter such experience? Uh question mark i find myself trying to knock on the door of religion but i resist uh well first of all i would say that that all of young's work um relates to this and and so i'm not going to solve your problem of lack of knowledge in a five minute talk here i would urge you to go look at at uh, my video entitled Finding the Living God, which is on uh, the homepage of this YouTube channel. It's easy to find. And uh, it's called Finding the Living God, in which I go through some of my own experiences. And by listening to my own experiences, uh, they might give you an aha moment of recognition. Yours won't be the same. But you can say, aha, that's what happened to me, too. And, and I would respond to that question with don't confuse confuse psychosis, psychosis with aphasia. If you have an inability to speak, overwhelmed by symbols, and you're only dealing with images, that's just alien and unfamiliar. So don't, don't misconstrue psychosis with just experience. And you can go Google um, psychoses as worked with in art, because there's a lot of studies they've done where they get someone who's psychotic, but what happens is they're intensely visual and intensely a lot of things, but not intensely explaining. And so mm -hmm. they find when they find the right art modality or medium, and they get the, psych the psychotic to work with some form of art, it 
shows them how to self-regulate this intensity in a lot of cases. So right. just Google psychosis and art, and you might you might find some studies and some works that will address that supposed overwhelm. Oftentimes right. the overwhelm is just a lot of unfamiliar and a lot of people aren't comfortable with the not knowing or just right. going out and exploring. Right. So Coleman goes on and says, trying to force myself into a denomination I am least resistant to. Well, I can't tell if I will, it will help me rest my experience on something more concrete. Do I just need to need a good group like this? No religion? Uh, Coleman, I would say that, um, first of all, um, religions are all systems which lead to the same thing, okay? And um, what, what I would say that Jungian psychology is, is beyond religion. In other words, above religion. We can look back at religion and we can say that all religions, all denominations uh, are, are ways for people with little experience to cope with their psychological turmoil, I would say. And, um, and so you take your pick and, and take your chances, but, but what, what we need to do if we want to, you know, you can get yourself awfully tied in knots by looking for the right religion, okay, and the correct, the true religion, and uh, and the fact is that all religions are true, and they're true in the same way, <laughs> and and, uh, and they work in the same way. They work with your psyche, um, metaphorically. They they guide you, and so that your psyche can work through various things and let you integrate things and prayer will do that and and so on um but what i'm talking about is a step beyond religion and you know it doesn't mean uh that i might never go to church i do go to church occasionally with mainly with my mother-in-law and i like it it's comforting to me uh, to hear a church service uh, that's based on my own upbringing in uh, the Protestant church. Uh, and so it's comforting in that way. But I recognize that what it's doing is it's, it's guiding me through um, a process that's within my psyche. Uh, I, I don't think of it as magical thinking anymore. I, I don't um, because what's happening is happening here. It's not happening out there. Okay. And, and so they've all developed over thousands of years and they work for people. And so people who haven't had as big thoughts as Carl Jung, um, need that need that crutch and so churches provide lots of things they pr provide community they provide entertainment they, um you know and and so on but there's no right church and the problem is that um you know over the last thousand years we've had wars sloshing back across uh, western europe and the middle east and um you know the subcontinent india there are constant wars between the the um, muslims and the and the uh hindus and um it it that doesn't get us anywhere as a species because uh there there's no right way and there are many ways and they all go to the same thing the same place and so if you understand that, then you don't have to get yourself wrapped around the crank about which one you should be attending. Go ahead. Tori. I was going to say, yeah, exactly that. And to speak even directly to the structure of Coleman's question, asking pretty much for a product, a solution, an answer, I, I'd say the answer is actually 
the opposite of what you asked. It's passage. It's experience between. And if you visualize stones across a river, instead of stepping on the stones, just hop in the river and experience and go between, not in a rushing river, obviously. Yeah. I don't want to jump in in class five rapids, but um, but understanding that instead of skipping stones in life, trying to figure out what's right, it's important to drop in and and go deep and experience both within and understand that it's literally being connected to your present tense right now. I mean, Jung called it the eternal moment. I call it the perpetual present. And that's a confluence of the past and the future coming together at right now. And right. so rather than should I do this or that, I think it's the fact that you asked the question is wonderful. That's like a trailhead in itself. But there's a sanctuary in exploring the experience of what that question means in your life. And so right. just navigate, take a you know, road trip called now. Right. When I, when I was yeah. 30 years old, I was, uh, I was a deacon in the Reformed Church. Um, and I had this consternation because I'd been raised up on the scientific method and everything rational. I was uh, a captain in the Marine Corps Reserve. Uh, I was a very rational kind of guy. I was a lawyer, also practicing law. And I had started to go to church primarily because I had children and I wanted to raise them uh, as Christians. Uh, but myself, I was somewhat agnostic, really. And but what I experienced is that when I went to church, when I came out, I felt better and I couldn't understand why. But every week when I went to church, I would go through the service with the pastor. Normally, I would fall asleep in the damn sermon because um, sermons put me to sleep. <laughs> you know, they hypnotize me. I go, oh. <laughs> but, but having been to church, having gone through the, the, you know, the service with the pastor through the ritual, um, I felt better. And I, it, I was, a, I realized that, but I couldn't put my finger on why. And I tried to talk to the pastor about it and he didn't have a clue about what I was talking about. Not a clue. And, and most of the, most people that are of the cloth that I've met have few clues about what's really happening. Uh, and, um, and so, um, you know, but what I would say to you now is that you know, if you want to be in heaven after your death, uh, you know, you're not going to be conscious of anything uh, after your death. And heaven is going to be in the minds of your children. Uh, and so if you be behave badly to your children, then you might be in hell. <laughs> well, you know, and I, I love, I, yeah, definitely. And I love David Bowie's statement or quote where he said, religion is for those who are afraid to go to hell. Spirituality is for those of us who've already been there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. And uh, uh, life can be you know, that. And it, it took me, it took me decades to work this stuff out i mean uh, if you go, you can go back and find my encounter with mephistopheles uh, which was a real a real vision i had at one point um the uh and my daughter said i'm sorry to say this to you dad but i think you're going to hell and she was 20, it was her 22nd birthday when she said that. And she literally, boom, dropped me into hell for a decade. And one of the reasons that I'm here now, and because I've spent so much time on Jungian psychology, is that uh, I have been to hell. 
and uh, and I had to climb out of it. Uh, and it, you know, fortunately, um, from a psychiatric point of view, uh, when Mephistopheles plopped down in the seat next to me, my wife, my daughter had said that <laughs> to me, and I. I said, you can have my immortal soul on my death, <laughs> but it's provided none of my daughters think that of me for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. And he disappeared. He accepted my bargain, my and Faustian that's a, bargain. I love that Faustian bargain that you provided and that you implemented, because what's what's so important about it is, I mean, what's the quote? The only way out is through. Right. But then another one is if you find yourself in hell live as if you own the place and right. so what as, happened your yeah. bargain was really not a suggestion it was this is this and this is the way it's going to be and you know you did pose it as if you, you know you can have this if that but in no place did you have a question mark in no way was that interrogative you were basically lieutenant colonel skip conover who's now the admiral of hell and you're, you're, you know, utilizing him as a, well, you know, you can do this son, but. (laughs) Yeah. I I was fortunate because I had already been studying union psychology for 12 years when that happened. And so I responded instinctually, but I knew immediately that it had been, uh, a psychic vision and it probably lasted the whole event probably didn't last more than five seconds right. and yet and yet you know i remember it so vividly and it it is is as if it lasted for a much longer period of time and uh and so um and you know i can imagine that many people if that happened to them, they they could drive off the road at, at 65 mm-hmm. miles an hour. It happened to me when I was driving at 65 miles an hour on a superhighway, and I could easily have ended up in a ditch because, mm-hmm. um, but anyway. Well, um, and I think your, your, exa- your example there and your experience to me is a prime example of my favorite concept in life is don't waste trouble. You know, they start shooting. You don't run back to the boss. Well, what do we do? We'll take the safety off. So I think, yeah. So I think we should uh, read these uh, next three footnotes, four, five, and six. Would you do that, Jordan? Certainly. And actually, by synchronicity, to jump back to that, I want to read my bookmark that you sent me because it comes from the supreme meaning, you know, from before. Right. The supreme meaning is the beginning and the end. It is the bridge of going across and fulfillment. So it's both. So I think that also speaks to Coleman's question of, you know, I think that should you, I think the answer is passage experience, because the bridge of going across and fulfillment, well, it's it's about the going across more than it is the fulfillment. So find the fulfillment in the going across right okay so we'll read these footnotes and then i'll give you the honor of doing uh, the supreme meaning so we're on number four i believe number right? four yeah please in 1955 1956 young noted that the union of the opposites of the destructive and constructive powers of the unconscious paralleled the me- messianic state of fulfillment depicted in this passage. And he did that in Mysterium Conjunctionis. In footnote five, in Goethe's Faust, Faust says to Wagner, what you call the spirit of the times is fundamentally the gentleman's own mind in which the times are reflected. That comes from Faust, yeah. From Faust. And... That's the, you know, Jung said, losing the influence of his own time. That's not the conscious expectation. So 
moving forward to footnote six, the draft continues. And then one whom I did not know, but who evidently had such knowledge said to me, what a strange task you have. You must disclose your innermost and lowermost. This I resisted since I hated nothing more than that which seemed to me unchaste and insolent. <laughs> so there's, there's prudishness and there's also the sacred and the profane going on there. Yeah. In transformations, footnote seven, in transformations and symbols of the libido, 1912, Jung interpreted God as a symbol of the libido. In his subsequent work, Jung laid great emphasis on the distinction between the God image and the metaphysical existence of God. So you see also the passages added to the revised, retitled 1952 edition, Symbols of Transformation. Yeah. And um, so what, what he's referring to is this comment that came up in a, in a uh, video, an uh, interview of Jung, where he was asked, do you believe in God? And uh, he, his response was, well, very complicated, but I have no need to believe, I know. And so um, what, and you can find that, that video on YouTube, just put in Carl Jung, uh, I have no need to believe, and it'll come right up on YouTube. But the point is that it doesn't matter what I say to you today in terms of God. Um, mm -hmm. If you haven't had this numinous experience, then you're, you, you probably won't believe me. Okay, and so what i can they'll ask to explain it and that's Pardon? or they'll ask for it to be explained and right. told and you have to you have to have your own passage your own experience to get to the place in life where in a sense you release the reins of parents friends you are yourself yours and you don't ask for permission you you know you may discuss things but it's it's your life your way Right. Uh, now I'm going to, um, and uh, Matt Blattner says this is from the documentary called A Matter of Heart, and that is the probably the interview that we're talking mm -hmm. about here, but there's actually a, a one minute segment of that, which actually has that quote in it, and um, Jonty says, if the demon is a chastising angel and the angel a demon on your side, our will is a silly rabbit. Uh, love you guys later. <laughs> okay, so anyway, um, I'm going to uh, step away for a moment, Jordan, but please read the italicized uh, yeah. uh, the Supreme yeah. Meaning. But the Supreme Meaning is the path the way and the bridge to what is to come. That is the God yet to come. It is not the coming God himself, but his image, which appears in the supreme meaning. God is an image, and those who worship him must worship him in the images of the supreme meaning. The supreme meaning is not a meaning and not an absurdity. It is image and force in one, magnificence and force together. The supreme meaning is the beginning and the end. It is the bridge of going across and fulfillment. The other gods died of their temporality, yet the supreme meaning never dies. It turns into meaning and then into absurdity, and out of the fire and blood of their collision, the supreme meaning rises up, rejuvenated anew. The image of God has a shadow. The supreme meaning is real and casts a shadow. For what can be actual and corporeal and have no shadow? The shadow is nonsense. 
it lacks force and has no continued existence through itself. But nonsense is the inseparable and undying brother of the supreme meaning, supreme meaning. Like plants, so men also grow, some in the light, others in the shadows. There are many who need the shadows and not the light. The image of God throws a shadow that is just as great as itself. The supreme meaning is great and small. It is as wide as the space of the starry heaven and as narrow as the cell of the living body. And from that, the next, I'll wait till Skip skips now back. Um, the Skip, I just finished that. Right. And there's the beautiful part of the absurdity and the shadow is nonsense, but at the same time, the nonsense dissipates into the fire and brings back anew. And so you can't have sense without nonsense. And you can't have light without shadow. Right. And what my my fun image for me with the supreme meaning piece is to look at the shadow at high noon, and you won't cast one. But what you have to realize is that then your shadow is underneath your feet. It's hidden, but it's the whole world you stand on. So that plays with scale. So instead of us casting shadows by time there's a timelessness quality to this image of god rather than the thing of god yeah and um well probably we should read this footnote a too um okay the terms um no, we, uh, don't bother with that. But okay, the terms. Don't what, what is a, what is great in man is that he is a bridge and not a goal. What can be loved in man, in humanity, is that humans are going across and a down going. I love those who do not know how to live except their lives be a down going, for they are those who are going over. Okay, so the point is that all of us are bridges to the future. Okay, humanity has experienced certain things, and yeah, science has explained a lot of good stuff and so on. But what, um, what will be, you know, what, what God directs of us comes from us in this generation okay it doesn't it doesn't come uh we are the result okay of millions of years of development and all eight billion of us are the result of that and gradually uh we are learning to live together on a very small planet um and, uh, you know, finally, at some point, may, ages and ages hence, um, hum, humans will be, will have to wake up and say, oh, we can't keep destroying one another because the person I just destroyed may be the one that discovers the astronaut, asteroid that's going to destroy the Earth, but because I killed them, um, the asteroid will destroy the earth right and at the well, moment and then, yeah, influence influence and consequences and so there's the you know the discernment of what comes from a lack of explaining but a deep knowing because right. it's not it's not hi i'm interviewing everyone i i see for a job how you know how am i relative to them we if we lose the comparison energy and instead put a dignity and difference, then we can discern the points of value right. rather than the monetary currency. 
And I think that what's interesting about that is with people, it's not how much are we each worth money wise, it's right. how much are we each, each worth value wise, you know, right. and that's, that's how you live in this society. Right. And so what we see, yeah, I mean, there is this phrase, there will be blood. And unfortunately, blood is how human beings have always learned and how all creatures learn. Um, because, you know, if you go out in the natural world, uh, it's a dog eat dog place. I mean, there are uh, there are creatures eating other creatures constantly. And, um, you know, um, I saw, you know, one time I would, used to have a house on this little pond and somebody put too much fertilizer in the, in the golf course up above and it killed about 3000 fish mm. that washed off up on the, on the um, shore of this pond, and I called Natural Resources and said, "Wow, you got to make those people truck this away, or it's going to be a huge stench." And the Natural Resources guy says, "Well, don't worry, nature will take care of it." Yep. And with that, within a week, all these fish were gone, every one of them. Uh, and uh, and you know that's an intimidating reality when you when you recognize it, that, right. you know, we don't see cadavers around the, around in parkland very often. I mean, occasionally we see a, a dead deer or something like that, but we don't often see cadavers. And the reason is that, that uh, it gets consumed. And, and so, and the same thing is going to happen to all of us one way or another um either we're going to contribute to global warming or the worms are going to eat us one way or another you know there's no turning back <laughs> well it's like when, when i'm hiking in the mountain you know in the mountains up at elevation um it's interesting if i come across a partially eaten carcass the, the first thing i do is smell for popcorn or smell for ammonia and the re reason is um big cat urine smells like popcorn before the bacteria turns into ammonia. Mm. And if I don't smell that, then I think, oh, is it bear? So, but what happens is I'm now at the restaurant and I'm on the menu. And so, there, <laughs> right. you know, yeah. and so there's kind of a, you know, I don't back away <laughs> slowly first. I have to do the radar of, well, which direction am I going to navigate? Because last thing I want to do is turn and go head on into a 180 pound or 140 pound, you know, mountain lion. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they're uh, reclusive, but not if right. I'm standing over the dinner plate, you know? Right. So we see, we see clashes like this. If you refer to the um, competition competition for um, uh, speaker of the house last weekend, um, you know, that uh, the House of Representatives is the result of uh, over 250 years of development, right? And, and so um, one of the things that we saw last week was that the Democratic side was solid, man. They, they were solidly in their seats. Everything was clear. And and uh, the Republican side is still bashing one another in. And, and so that's bloody. And, and you know, when, when we see somebody like Matt Gates rubbing Kevin uh, McCarthy's nose in it, uh, I think of the old saying, uh, you know, youth will be served often on silver platters. Right. And, and so... Matt Gates got this smug moment where he stopped uh, McCarthy's election in the 14th ballot. Um, but uh, in the end, uh, he couldn't win. And, and, um, and he has no idea what price he's going to pay for that game he played. 
and mm-hmm. and the rest of them too. They have no idea what price will be paid, and it will be more clashes. And uh, so what I what I saw was a future Speaker of the House who's going to reign as Speaker of the House for a very long time, and that's Hakeem Jeffries. And uh, because you know the the uh, Democrats used to have a circular firing squad like that, but they have seen the error in their ways now, and it's the Republicans that are going to have to get their act together and that that's going to be very painful over the next couple of years and and so it, that's the supreme meaning that's what god is trying to tell us right and well and through uh, all those votes and all those ballots um the only thing that kept coming up was a scene from braveheart where you know William Wallace, aka you know Mel Gibson in the movie, yeah. goes while you're here, all always squabbling over the scraps from Longshank's table. You know, it's these little children, you know, yeah. just squabbling. And yeah. and it, what are they going to get? Oh, cool! I I can stand on the top of the mountain. The problem with the top of the mountain is there's only room for one, so you're always going to be knocked off. And but this whole last week was such an absurdity and yeah. but you really saw the oh wow okay look at look at all these there are no adults other than Liz Cheney you know and it, it's it's just wild because it, it was wow you're doing that in public you're you're right. I wouldn't even do that in private and you know, it's like right so so now there's now, Young in the Red Book now refers to this. He says, mm-hmm. uh, continuing on now, this is from the Red Book. Uh, the spirit of this time in, in me wanted to recognize the greatness and extent of the supreme meaning, but not its littleness. The spirit of the depths, however, conquered this arrogance, and I had to swallow the small as a mean as a means of healing the immortal in me. I completely burn up my innards since it was inglorious and unheroic. It was even ridiculous and revolting, but the pliers of the spirit of the depths held me and I had to drink the bitterest of all drafts. Um, And, uh, and so Matt Gates didn't want to, uh, recognize the littleness but in the end he had to he had to you know vote present in and let mccarthy become speaker of the house and that that's the bitterest of all drafts but nonetheless um you know uh it demonstrated something and and so life will go on but but change will happen you know as mm-hmm. roosevelt said uh the only thing that doesn't change is change itself right and and those few insurgents that made such a spectacle on uh friday friday night uh it'll be quite interesting to see where they are uh two years from now um so well, and i heard a comedian um yesterday Friday recently and he said I, you know and you know it's completely tongue-in-cheek and I'm going to preface that because I don't want anyone to snip it off and uh, misquote but he said you know well Trump he brought jobs back to America we don't have to import terrorists anymore we have white illiterate people who are now our local American terrorists it's the new job that he has brought to people and, and it was, at first I was laughing and then I was sad and then I was angry and then I was just kind of nodding at all of them. And, you know, the stirring up the bitterest of all drafts to right. serve it out in, you know, in public. And it just, it's, it's, yeah. It's, okay. So the spirit of this time tempted me with the thought that all this belongs to the shadowiness of the God image. This would be pernicious 
deception since the shadow is nonsense, but the small, narrow, and banal is not nonsense, but one of both of the essences of the Godhead. I resisted recognizing that the everyday belongs to the image of the Godhead. I fled this thought. I hid myself behind the highest and coldest stars, but the spirit of the depths caught up with me and forced the bitter drink between my lips. The spirit of this time whispered to me, this supreme meaning, this image of God, this melting together of hot and the cold, that is you and only you. But the spirit of the depths spoke to me, you are an image of the unending world. All the last mi mysteries and be of becoming and passing away live in you. If you did not possess all this, how could you know? And so the point being that you, are, everyone here that's listening to this, you are an image of the unending world. And all of the last mysteries of becoming and passing away live in you. If you, if you did not possess all this, how could you know? And, um, and that reminds me of, you know, first there was the capital W word. And the thing is, word is not text like in Palatino or Times New Roman font. The word was a Hebraic calligraphy image and the word contained the four. And what's interesting is it's not a, you know, like T-H-E, an article, spirit, a noun of preposition this time whisper to me none of that's it's not that kind of word the word was then image and that's also why there's the ineffable and inutterable name because it's not a word it's an image so there's a there's a difference in i think how that word so to speak actually was uh, worded because at that point the capital w word was image and not a piece of letters and text like we would put together today right all right let me uh i'm gonna blast through the next uh segment here and we, um okay for the sake of my human weakness the spirit of the depths gave me this word yet this word is also superfluous since so i do not speak it freely but because i must I speak because the spirit robs me of joy and life if I do not speak. I am the serf who brings it and does not know what he carries in his hand. It would burn his hands if he did not place it where his master orders him to lay it. The spirit of our time spoke to me and said, what dire urgency could be forcing you to speak all this? This was an awful temptation. I wanted to ponder what inner or outer bind could force me into this. And because I found nothing that I could grasp, I was near to pay, making up one, making one up. But with this, the spirit of our time had almost brought it about that instead of speaking, I was thinking again about reasons and explanations. But the spirit of the depths spoke to me and said, to understand a thing is a bridge and, a, and possibly an impossibility of returning to the path. But to explain a matter is arbitrary and sometimes even murder. Have you counted the murderers among the scholars? But the spirit of this time stepped up to me and laid before me huge volumes which contained all my knowledge. Their pages were made of ore and a steel stylus had engraved inexorable words in them. And he pointed to these inexorable words and spoke to me and said, what you speak, that is madness. It is true, it is true, but I speak, what I speak is the greatness and intoxication and ugliness of mad madness. But the spirit of the depth stepped up, stepped up to me and said, what you speak is, the greatness is, the intoxication is, the undignified, sick, paltry dailiness is. It runs in all the streets. 
lives in all the houses and rules the day of all humanity. Even the eternal stars are commonplace. It is the great mistress and the one essence of God. One laughs about it, and laughter, too, is. Do you believe, man of this time, that laughter is lower than worship? Where is your measure, false measurer? The sum of life decides in laughter and in worship, not your judgment. I would like to quote um, Victor Borja there in regards to... Uh, <laughs> Do you believe, man of this time, that laughter is lower than worship? And what's interesting, Victor Borgia said, laughter is the shortest distance between people. And in that, that's a connection. And that's, that's a divine, numinous um, relationship between people. I mean, when you laugh with someone, it's, you're, you're swimming together. I mean, you are, there's a connection. And I think that's important where laughter is the shortest distance between people and worship. Um, I laugh when someone says, oh, it brings me closer to God. And I'm like, well, it's everywhere. How do you get any closer? So, but at the same time, it's about a deepening rather than a proximity. And I think that deepening of laughter and deepening of worship are both part of the divine, as it were. And I think that some of life decides in laughter and in worship, not judgment. So I think that, you know, the murdering of explaining is that you can only say so much. You can't say that everything of what one thing is in its entirety. And so once you start, you kind of run on a primrose path of, of your explaining and your, your cherry picking what you've judged and discerned, but not the, I'm going to worship in a sense, here's an identity. And you're, you're still muted too. So if your cough is better. Right, I'm under control now. Um, okay. okay, so uh, this, is, this is an important part, but yes, you can read. And this is the part that he had the prefigurations on and, explained it to exploit he explains it here so go ahead and read on i must also speak the ridiculous you coming men you will recognize the supreme meaning by the fact that he is laughter and worship a bloody laughter and a bloody worship a sacrificial blood binds the poles those who know this laugh and worship in the same breath after this however <laughs> I humanity approached me and said, what solitude, what coldness of desolation you lay upon me when you speak such. Reflect on the destruction of being and the streams of blood from the terrible sacrifice that the depths demand. But the spirit of the depths said, no one can or should halt sacrifice. Sacrifice is not destruction. Sacrifice is the foundation stone of what is to come. Have you not had monasteries? Have not countless thousands gone into the desert? You should carry the monastery in yourself. The desert is within <clears throat> you. The desert calls you and draws you back. And if you were fettered to the world of this time with iron, the call of the desert would break all chains. Truly, I prepare you for solitude. After this, my humanity remained silent. Something happened to my spirit. However, which I must, must call mercy. My speech is imperfect, not because I want to shine with words, but out of the impossibility of finding those words, I speak in images. With nothing else can I express the words from the depths. The mercy which happened to me gave me belief, hope, and sufficient daring not to resist further the spirit of the depths but to utter his word. But before I could pull myself together to really do it, I needed a visible sign that would show me the spirit of. Let me, show me the that the spirit of the depths. Yeah, I just switch pages and zoom. 
spirit of the deaths in me was at the same time the ruler of the deaths of world affairs. And now he goes on to quote, um, actually, no, it's a footnote. Um, it happened in October of the year 1913 as I was leaving alone for a journey. But during the day, I was suddenly overcome in broad daylight by a vision. I saw a terrible flood that covered all the northern and low-lying lands between the North Sea and the Alps. It reached from England up to Russia and from the west coast and from the coast of the North Sea right up to the Alps. I saw yellow waves, swimming rubble, and the death of countless thousands. This vision lasted for two hours. It confused me and made me ill. I was not able to interpret it. Two weeks passed, then the vision returned, still more violent than before. And an inner voice spoke, look at it. It is completely real and it will come to pass. You cannot doubt this. I wrestled again for two hours with this vision, but it held me fast. It left me exhausted, <clears throat> confused, and I thought my mind had gone crazy. From then on, the anxiety toward the terrible event that stood directly before us kept coming back. Once I also saw a sea of blood over the northern lands. In the year 1914, in the month of June, at the beginning and end of the month, and at the beginning of July, I had the same dream three times. I was in a foreign land, and suddenly, overnight, <clears throat> and right in the middle of summer, a terrible cold descended from space. All seas and rivers were locked in ice. Every green living thing had frozen. The second dream was thoroughly similar to this, but the third dream at the beginning of, at the beginning of July went as follows. I was in a remote English land. It was necessary that I return to my homeland with a fast ship as speedily as possible. I reached home quickly. In my homeland, I found that in the middle of the summer, a terrible cold had fallen from space, which had turned every living thing into ice. There stood a leaf-bearing but fruitless tree whose leaves had turned into sweet grapes full of healing juice through the working of the frost. I picked some grapes and gave them to a great waiting throng. In reality now, it was so. At the time, when the Great War broke out between the peoples of Europe, I found myself in Scotland, compelled by the <clears> war to choose the fastest ship and the shortest route home. I encountered the colossal cold that froze everything. I met up with the flood, the sea of blood, and found my barren tree whose leaves the frost had transformed into a remedy. And I plucked the ripe fruit and gave it to you. And I do not know what I poured out for you what bittersweet, intoxicating drink, which left on your tongues an aftertaste of blood. So let me, uh, I'll finish it off here. Okay. <clears throat> Leave me. It is no teaching and no instruction that I give you. On what basis should I presume to teach you? I give you news of the way of this man, but not of your own way. My path is not your path. Therefore, I cannot teach you. The way is within us, but not in God's, not in teachings, nor in laws. Within us is the way, the truth, and the life. Woe betide those who live by way of examples. Life is not with them. If you live according to an example, you thus live the life of that example. But who should live your own life if not yourself? So live yourselves. The signposts have all fallen. Unblazed trails lie before us. Do not be greedy to gobble up the fruits of foreign lands, fields. Do, do you not know that you yourselves are the fertile ache acre which bears everything that avails you yet who today knows this who knows the way to the eternally fruitful climes of the soul you seek the way through mere appearances you study books and give ear 
to all kinds of opinion. What good is all that? There is only one way, and that is your way. You seek the path, I warn you away from my own. I can also be wrong. It can also be the wrong way for you. May each go his own way. I will be no savior, no lawgiver, no master teacher unto you. You are no longer little children, giving laws, bettering, making things easier has all become wrong and evil. May each one seek out his own way. The way leads to mutual love in community. Men will come to see and feel the similarity and commonality of their ways. Laws and teachings held in common compel people to solitude so that they may escape the pressure of undesirable contact. But solitude makes people hostile and venomous. Therefore, give people dignity and let each of them stand apart so that each may find his own fellowship and love it. Power stands against power, contempt against contempt, love against love. Give humanity dignity and trust that life will find the better way. The one eye of the Godhead is blind. The one ear of the Godhead is deaf. The order of its being is crossed by chaos. So be patient with the crippledness of the world and do not overvalue its consummate beauty. Yeah, that's that's such a powerful passage. Yeah. With the, you know, but solitude makes people hostile and venomous, but let each of them stand apart so they may find their own fellowship and love it. And I think that's the difference between loneliness and solitude. Loneliness is, you know, not something people want to feel. 15 or so. But in 1933, uh, uh, Krishnamurti, Krishnamurti was a person who uh, was discovered on the beach in uh, what is now Chennai and Madras <clears throat> by Annie Besant. And Annie Besant was uh, one of the leaders of the Theosophist Society. And she was looking for a new messiah. And when Krishnamurti was 10 years old, she met him on the beach and he had this tremendous aura around him. And because of that aura, she took him and his brother in and educated them, sent them to Oxford uh, and started to reveal that she believed he would be the new Messiah. Uh, and, uh, and various people thought this over the years for about it for about a quarter of a century. But in 1933, there was a, a global meeting of the, the Theosophist Society in uh, the Netherlands. And it was thought that at that time, uh, Krishnamurti would step forward and it, it was, I forget how old he was, but anyway, 1933 is when it happened. Um, and various people were saying that he was the new Messiah and, and so on. And Krishnamurti set up, st stood up and gave his talk. And he said, um, you know, I'm not the new Messiah uh, and I don't want any followers. And the result of that was that he ended up being a kind of Messiah for the rest of his life. And he had followers for the rest of his life. Um, and yet, and yet he made a similar disclaimer as Jung did, uh, which was that, you know, I will be no teacher, uh, no master teacher, no lawgiver, no savior to you. And so the point is that 
you know, Jordan and I aren't saviors in any sense of the word. We're only interpreting the work of uh, a Swiss psychiatrist who's been dead for quite a while, 62 years, I guess. And and I think to reinforce that, I'd, I'd put in Groucho Marx, you know, any group that would have me as a member, I don't respect very much. Right. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, um, I have a few little uh, things I have to take care of here. Uh, okay. Um, so the point is that we don't have any master solutions here. And this is only the first chapter of this profound book called The Red Book. Um, and you have to find your own way. Everybody has to find their own way. That's the answer. And, and uh, or as Gertrude Stein once interpreted it, there ain't no answer. There ain't going to be no answer. There never has been any answer. Right. That's the answer. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's one of the mantras that comes up most in, with my clients is just four words, you know, your life, your way. It's about helping people see past the blind spots of expectation yeah. and see what actually is going to be resonant for them that the, their life then becomes a symbol, generative. Rather than, oh, look, I explained all this and checked it off like a grocery list. Well, there's not a lot of meaning in that. And people then wonder why they're not fulfilled. But when they're, the, the currency of value is in their process and the things they make are milestones in the moment leading to further discovery, there starts to be a generative thing and they start to find their life, their way. And I find that to be some of the most rewarding work is seeing someone light up and say something that I almost can't understand, but that right. is absolutely clear to them. And it, it's, it's nice because then I realize they've come into their own language of how right. they experience their way rather than the way they've been taught to or expect they should. Yeah, there are a couple of important footnotes here. Uh, footnote 28. The draft continues. One should not turn people into sheep but sheep into people. The spirit of the depths demands this, who is beyond present and past. Speak and write for those who want to listen and read, but do not run after men so that you do not soil the dignity of humanity. It is a rare good. A sad demise in dignity is better than an undignified healing. Whoever wants to be a doctor of the soul sees people as being sick. He offends human dignity. It is presumptuous to say that man is sick. Whoever wants to be the soul shepherd treats people like sheep. He violates human dignity. It is insolent to say that people are like sheep. Who gives you the right to say that man is sick and a sheep? Give him human dignity so he may find his ascendancy or his downfall his way. And then footnote 29. This is all, my dear friends, that I can tell you about the grounds and aims of my message, which I am burdened with like the patient donkey with a heavy load. He is glad to put it down. And... Sono Shamdasani, um, who spent 13 years bringing the Red Book to uh, life and getting it published, uh, said the same thing, that he was burdened like the patient donkey with a heavy load. He is glad to put it down. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, I'm not... Uh, I don't, we don't want to burden you with any specific belief here, okay? That is for you to find you know, on your own. I have found a lot of solace in Carl Jung's work over 
35 years now, and uh, Carl Jung has been my shrink. I acknowledge that, although I never met him. Uh, our lives did uh, correspond for about 15 years. And, um, and I don't really know all the connections uh, in, in, in many ways. There are many ways that my life has connect, connected with him. Uh, and I've talked about that previously, so I won't do it here. But um, I'm looking forward to uh, the coming readings of uh, from the Red Book. So next week, we will begin with Refinding the Soul. Refinding the Soul. Is and tough. I love that you use the word soulless, because what's interesting to me, and it's a word play, but it, it works for me, is soulless is not soulless at all. And it's interesting, the quiet is full. Yeah, John D. Thackeray says, um, truth is like a lion. You can try and ma manipulate it, it, but it will lovingly rip your head off. <laughs> 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 right that's a good one yeah and you know this is one of the reasons why i although i early on thought i might earn some money by doing this work i um gave that aspiration up long ago and uh now you know for most of the last six and a half years i've only done this as a labor of love and hopefully it helps uh, a lot of you as well and so we will be back next uh next sunday and jordan thank you very much for being my fellow traveler in this um, yeah sorry about the little uh, you know nothing begins sometimes nothing great begins without a little controversy i do a little scramble going wait that's not on my desk. Uh oh, it's where's the drop box? Yeah, uh -oh. I don't know why you haven't gotten that book though, because I ordered that in mid uh, December. mid December, and uh, I'm gonna have to double check it. And, uh, yeah, on do because I I think I um I remember receiving a this is on the way, but then yeah. I never received the this has arrived, and I have my box because I don't check it every day. But I get an I get an email if anything arrives, and I don't. Um, right. So um, anyway, I'll go back to Amazon and see if I can figure out what's going on with it. Maybe Santa took it back up to the North Pole. Well, I think that it, you know it. It was briefly out of print. Okay, right. it was. Uh, it was briefly. Uh, yeah. uh, being sold at a very high price on Amazon and it keeps getting ordered again and again. My, my copy, as you see, is very heavily marked up, uh, right. mainly because um, uh, the false leather is dying here, but uh, <laughs> that's only to protect my, my folio edition, which I, bought a lectern for <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it, living it, room. A lectern. it does need a lectern yeah so anyway all right so thank you very much everybody and we'll see you next week i hope yep. and thanks jordan see you on week. wednesday for the advanced group glad uh, <clears throat> just as a reminder we have discontinued <clears throat> sorry discontinued the monday evening uh meeting and so we're only doing uh, Sundays and uh, the Wednesday advanced reading group. So.